Hi, Woodwind class of April the 8th, 2020. Here's a little video uh, that I'm going, that I'm making for you right now, in fact, uh, about recording techniques. I've been recording, doing recording sessions and lately more recording at home um, for a very long time. And it's a skill like any other that you develop different aspects of. So hopefully I'm going to share some of those ideas today with you. A lot of them are common sense, but common sense is not all that commonplace and um, sometimes you don't learn it until you're told it. The first thing I want to tell you though, so you can find this when you go back to it, is a little task that we're going to set you for Woodwind Workshop. It's not a long one, um, but it should be achievable and hopefully the hints that follow will help you achieve that a little better. The task is I'd like you to record yourself playing say up to 30 seconds of music if it's any longer we're not going to get a chance to get through uh, as many as we can so the idea is just choose 30 seconds of music it can be a couple of scales but ideally part of a study that you're working on for your whip or uh, a piece that you love to play whatever it is i would like you to make it the best that you can make it so don't just record your first take as if it's an exam i want you to do this as if it's a job that you're doing um, for a client because that's what recordings often are or it's an album that you're presenting to the world you want it to be the best you possibly can uh, make this 30 seconds obviously one take start to finish for now uh, but get the best sound you possibly can and deliver the best product you possibly can uh, and I believe you'll need to send those to Nicole is how that's going to work. So let's consider that that's what you'll do. You'll be sending an MP3 to Nicole if you can figure out how to do that. All right. So now I'm going to talk to you about general recording principles. And in fact, today what I'm doing is um, I've I've downloaded Audacity onto my Mac and figured out how to make it work on Catalina. No mean feat, I promise you. Technology is our challenge when we're recording. Uh, but I would very often use GarageBand, which um, apparently uses all the same engines that Pro Tools uses uh, or that Logic uses, I believe. Um, so you can get all the same kind of sounds, but it's a lot easier to use. I'm going to show you a little bit later some of the the ins and outs of GarageBand that I use all the time that are maybe not so easy to find or that are quite fun to use. And that's going to be a challenge because I'm going to get quick time to record the screen and hopefully all this will work all together. It's quite a challenge. All right, I've made some notes here. The first thing I want to talk to you about is the mindset of the recording musician. It's a very different environment, if you like, to that of the performing musician. And the result in a lot of ways that you're seeking to achieve is a different result. It's, um, it, uh, you know, you would have heard live recordings compared to studio recordings. There's much more control in studio recordings. They don't have that live buzz. Sometimes you'll get live recordings that are done in a studio. That's different. But the main thing we're talking about is the studio recording. So you still want it to be as musical and as expressive as you possibly can. But there's no audience, uh, there's no ambience to, to kind of get you into that situation. So you need to actually practice for that in the practice room uh, in the way that you practice for performance. You, you, you know, when you're practicing for performance, sometimes you go, OK, performance is tomorrow. I'm going to perform this piece to the wall. Well, in this case, you're performing this piece to be recorded. It's just the same thing. So you've got to find a way to get yourself, uh, I guess, a little pumped up, um, a little energized to play with energy and and to give a performance. Now, having said that, uh, one of the things I love about recording is that if you don't get it right, you can do it again. And that gives you a certain amount of freedom with what you're doing, that you don't have to f get really tense about it. Lots of people get red light fever and can't overcome that when they're recording. Uh, I would say the majority of musicians are not very good recording musicians because they haven't done it a lot, but they might be great performers. So that's something you can practice in the studio to, to get that, that mindset of going, oh, well, I didn't get it right this time. I can do it again. Generally speaking, you can do that. All right, there's much more I could probably say about mindset, but it's also going to 
take hours and hours and, and I don't want to keep you going too long. The preparation was my next point, And in fact, we've, we've talked about that. Um, if you're going to do a session at a studio somewhere, or if you've only got a certain amount of time to do it at home anyway, you want to practice like you do anything else. Uh, if you're, well, you just, you can only bring what you've got to the studio. So as much as possible, you prepare for that recording session. I really recommend warming up well before you start thinking about recording because you, you've got to make sure you're in, in tune, you're producing your best sound before you get there. That's often hard to do. I A lot of my recording sessions, I end up taking four or five instruments because I'm having to do whole sections at once. And I'll show you that in a little while. But get yourself warmed up as much as you possibly can and, and take care of business in that way. All right. The next note I have is what is the job at hand? And again, that's a good way of getting rid of our nerves is just focusing on what do I have to do right now? What is the job? Unless you're improvising, very often your job is to play in time and in tune with the best sound, making it sound as good as you possibly can and obviously getting the correct style and all the same things you would with a normal piece of music. But it, it's sometimes a, a little little tighter. You, you just need to focus on exactly what you, what you need to do. You're not getting carried away with the performance. Um, I suppose I, I see that as something a lot bigger than I'm making it, but it, it's about your focus. Just focus on what you have to do and achieving that best result. A lot of that, I guess I'm referring to is what I do when I record at home. I'm recording a section. Sometimes we we'll use a bit of uh, auto-tune. There's a, a pitch correction function in GarageBand that I sometimes use. If I'm playing an instrument that I haven't played very much lately, I'm not playing as in tune as I might normally, or if I'm playing my baritone, which is really out of tune, I'll often put that on just to get it generally in tune. And sometimes it will be the baritone part that I want to be really in tune so all the upper parts can, can sit nicely on that. You might think, well, look, shouldn't you be able to play beautifully in tune yourself all the time? Ideally, yes, but we've got to get the job done. We've got to make it as good as we possibly can. So sometimes a bit of auto-tuning actually is, is very useful. And uh, you'll find that sometimes when you're recording that there might be half a bar that you just can't play with the rest of it. But you'll manage to find a little gap on either side of that half a bar. That means you can have several goes at that half a bar and then move it and slot it in because the job is to get the recording sounding good. So that's what I mean by make sure you do the job at hand. As far as your uni stuff's concerned, you're not going to really be able to do that. That's not the point of that. But if you're actually doing recording projects, that's what I'd be wanting to do, is make sure that everything that gets recorded is the best that you can make it. And you, I guess you can call it cheating. <laughs> you cheat if you need to. It's not really cheating. It's just getting it the best it can be. Uh, a little bit about microphone placement. You might be able to see just over here. Maybe it's out of the video shot. Um, I have a quite a good microphone that one of my recording engineer friends actually loaned me, has loaned it to me on long term, a nice valve microphone. Uh, the gear can be really, can make a difference, but uh, I've done many, many recordings on a, a USB microphone, a Samson, I didn't put it in here, uh, CU something or other, it's the most common one. I just looked them up this morning, they cost about a hundred bucks. It's a really worthwhile investment. It's a USB microphone, and if you plug it in, Audacity or GarageBand will see it, and they will say, do you want to use this? And you can say yes, and off you go, get it a little stand or whatever you need to do. Generally speaking, uh, if, if I'm in, I have a little studio that I built here at home. It's four meters by two meters, so it's quite small. It's a wooden shed on the outside. Uh, it's had some sound treatment. You can see this behind here is actually, uh, it's got rock wall in it and it's got um, deadening material on it. I've got another one over here. So that makes a reasonably dead sound here. So I'm not getting what's called room in my microphone too much. I think you can probably hear a bit of reverb. That's naturally what comes out on Audacity. Uh, 
uh, but that's not room reverb. So it, it means I can get a, quite a nice clear sound if I'm in a dead room. Uh, that's that's really important for recording. You don't want to be recording in a bathroom or in a toilet or anything like that because you'll you'll get so much reverb from that that it will disrupt your sound and it will make it harder to edit later on. If you want to add your own reverb, uh, it, it yeah. So you want the deadest room you possibly can. Um, generally speaking, microphone placement I wanted to talk about, and that is really quite different for each, each instrument. But generally speaking, I look to be about a foot away from the microphone, and then I adjust my levels on GarageBand according to the waveform. We're getting really technical here, and, and, and I'm not a super technical sound engineer, even though I've done a fair bit of it lately. I'm still very basic at it. I don't know all the jargon, but essentially you adjust your input level so that when you're playing the loudest note that you're going to play, it doesn't go outside of the band of the track that you can see. Uh, you'll see on GarageBand in a minute when I work with that, that all my waveforms are within the, the, I can see all the top of them. So they're not going to clip, they're not going to distort. We don't want distortion in there. But we also want enough level that we're going to be able to work with it. If the level is too low and it's really tiny little waveforms, you'll actually find you get a really hissy sound, you don't get enough sort of clarity in it. So before you record, you really need to adjust your levels. But I would play a, about a foot away from the microphone. I do experiment with that a little bit. Sometimes um, I won't point directly at it. I find when I'm recording the trumpet and I don't always have a very good trumpet sound, um, that sometimes I get a better sound if I don't point at the microphone. Uh, it's, a, it's a less direct sound. That can happen with the saxophone too sometimes. But you know, the flute, we really, we want the, the recording microphone. This is for recording at home. This is different to live performance. About a foot away or maybe even a little closer with a flute and, and the tone hole sometimes is, is good to point at the microphone. But ideally, we actually sit the microphone up above, maybe a bit further along the flute uh, from above, just to get a better sound. We certainly don't want the flute in the way of the airstream. Sorry, we don't want the microphone in the way of the airstream because we get some shh sound. So we avoid that. I actually like the, the flute mic up above, somewhere along there. You need to have an experiment. Clarinet. Um, down in front of it, the same with soprano, saxophone, again about a foot away, live recording is a little different. When you're playing an ensemble, you need to be much closer mic, so that's a different story. Okay, uh, this could go on and on because I can get into much more detail. The, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is writing the peak, I've called it, and that is that at a certain point, if you keep re recording the same thing over and over again, let's say it's a difficult passage, you're really having trouble getting it right or you're having trouble getting it sounding good, after a certain number of repetitions, you probably find that you need to stop. And that may be the best you can do. Now, if you have lots of time uh, and you want to take as much time as you need, you might come back tomorrow and do it again. I've had to do that uh, um, a number of times a, a David Hirschfeld a story I could tell you later if you want to hear about that. That one was the like a nightmare, but um, got there in the end. And sometimes you have to do that. You just have to say, that's the best I can do at the moment. I find that if I've got a difficult passage that I'm trying to play after a certain am amount of repetitions, let's say it's 10 or 12, I'm about done. For that, uh, I can go back and listen to them and choose my best one. And if I don't have time to go back to the next day, I'll just do what I need to do. Sometimes you might find you're playing too loud or too soft or trying too hard or rushing, you know, all those normal things we do. You can really hear it well when you listen back to those recordings and you have to listen back to figure out whether you've done a good job or not. Uh, something else occurred to me about that then, but I can't remember what that was, so it probably wasn't that important. Oh, it's writing the peak. Also, you'll find that it's really easy to sit in a recording studio and go and go and go 
and two hours has gone by and you keep recording because it's really fun. It's much more fun than computer games, I promise you. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to record. But your concentration goes really fast in a recording studio because it's very intense. And in fact, I like to record best with a producer, in other words, someone else behind the, the, the desk saying, do it again, that one was great, try this, um, you know, just relax. Dif different producers have different ways of working and uh, the best ones often say very little. The best ones you will usually say, that's great, let's keep that one. Because you as a performer don't always know what your best performance is. It's actually quite hard at home to self-produce, but there's a good chance that you're going to need to do that. So you sit, you play something, you might have a sense of, yeah, really, I needed to do that again. Sometimes your first take, don't write it off. Sometimes it's the best one, especially for an improvised solo. You might be surprised. But more often than not, you'll do a first take and go, okay, well, that was like a run, and you should record every run. Unless you absolutely know, I'm sight reading this, it's not going to be any good. Uh, I would record more than you think. But then, uh, yeah, you, you'll find that um, lack of concentration, I've kind of got off the track here, but I'm going to go back to the, the two hour thing. Lack of concentration will start to creep in because it does get very intense, especially the listening back going, yeah, that was, an, okay, I've got to do this again. It gets really intense. Your concentration goes very fast. So I would do it in you know, small amounts and then, step aside, take your headphones off, walk outside, breathe some fresh air, drink lots of water, go and you know, throw the ball for the dog three times or something like that, especially because we're doing this a lot at home at the moment. All right, I could talk more about that, but what I want to do now is um, show you something on GarageBand that I recorded uh, last Christmas um, that was used in Crown Casino or in the, in the atrium in Crown Casino for their Christmas thing. So this was an actual job. So that's enough of that. You can hear that. You can also hear me feeding back a little bit because I've got the speaker going there so I can hear it. Uh, that should be okay. Uh, you can see here I've recorded flute, alto flute, oboe, clarinet, not a second clarinet, and five saxophones in this section. Now, some things I can tell you about doing this. One of the first questions is, what do I record first? A lot of people will tell you, record the baritone saxophone first. And I can solo that. We can have a little listen to the baritone. This is Horace. And obviously, you know, we like to have, have the root nicely down there. Now, having said that, it's good to record the baritone first. And sorry if I'm getting myself a bit distracted here. I've got a feeling on this one, I decided to record the second alto first because... Uh, when I'm playing, I, I want the lead chair obviously to be really nice and, and stylistic in a saxophone section. And I find if I'm doing that by myself or just with a baritone, I don't have enough support. And as a lead player, I often like to, to feel that I've got the second alto right, right in there beside me playing nice and strong. And I can really tune to them and can sit my, my style up on top of, of what they're doing. So I recorded the alto two first certainly in a recent session, I think it was this one. And uh, it really gave me, and I really made sure that that alto two part was very in time as well. So you can see the waveforms there and the bar numbers up here, you know, there's bar 4.3. Um, that's the beat 4.3, there's bar five, and you can see the waveform there, you know, I'm pretty close. I haven't tried to quantize it or anything, but I've made sure the alto part was 
you know, really nicely in time. I, I, I really took the time to make sure it was good. I guess I don't want to blather on too much about this because I could take all day and I do really love it. It's really fun. So I recorded Alto 2, Alto 1. Uh, I, I reckon I might have gone and done the baritone part next just to make sure everything was really secure and then filled in the tenor parts. Uh, now the woodwind parts, I reckon I probably did. Uh, I might have taken the same principle. I'm not sure whether I actually did use alto flute in the end or whether I just used normal flute. Or something. Sounds like a normal flute to me, as far as I can tell. Uh, and then the oboe, I, look, I was a bit out of shape on the oboe, so I know I've auto-tuned that because I just had actually had a look at it before. And uh, it, yeah, it was a little bit rough, but... And then a little solo later on, which I... Um, it was one of those ones that I did the best I could with, you know, being out of shape with really dodgy reeds. Yeah, it's okay, but really could have been better. And, you know, then making sure that tuning across the section, I just uh, have a listen just to the woodwinds, that tuning across the section, you know, was really as acceptable as possible. Now, the interesting thing, and this is actually quite important, tuning when you're recording is not the same as it is playing with a live section because you're having to adapt each time you play to the parts that you've already played. They can't adapt to you. So as you go, you need to actually make sure each part is in tune and really pay attention to that as much as you possibly can because it makes a really big difference. Playing in time and playing in tune are actually much more important when you're doing this kind of thing. Okay, uh, the last, actually what that was the last thing I wanted to talk about. I'm sure you'll have many more questions, uh, things I've neglected to tell you, but they're the things I thought of. I guess actually one thing I didn't say was uh, headphones. I tend to play, I tend to find that one headphone on and one headphone half on is best for me. A lot of people do one on, one off. In fact, at Eaton's recording studios, the headphones, which are about 50 years old, only have one ear, most of them, uh, for orchestral musicians. And that's an open ear, so it's got a bit of foam on it. And so you can hear through that. You can hear into the room, but you can get you know, what you need in there. It's always good to have a bit of yourself in there, but not too much. You have to hear what you're playing with potentially a little bit more than you. And it really varies even from moment to moment. Sometimes if, you, if you're playing in a really big loud section, you might need more of you. If you're playing in a really soft section, suddenly you're too loud. Uh, that's not all that easy to manipulate with GarageBand and Audacity, but bear in mind, you do need to hear yourself and you need to hear what you're playing with. I err on the side of hearing what I'm playing with a little bit more than myself but be careful not to overblow. I've realized there's something else that's quite important for you to know about, and that is how to make your recorded sound come out a little better. Uh, at the moment, you know, if you put something in, even though I've done this on a good microphone with an interface, um, it still goes in sounding pretty natural. <laughs> jazz articulation on D, melodic, D harmonic minor. Now what I'm going to do is uh, on GarageBand, you can go over here, if you can see that, I hope you can, over here it says voice. Uh, I'm not sure that the movie has <laughs> got that, but anyway, I've clicked on voice and I've gone down to these and, and one that I quite like, and it's just a preset. If you click on natural narration vocal, it's got all these things in it, a whole lot of EQs and two compressors and you can even put a DSer in if you want. All these settings that you can change. I don't mess with them if I can possibly help it because the presets are there for a reason. And I found this actually quite sounds quite a bit better. Well, I don't know how much better it sounds to you, but what if we go telephone vocal just out of interest? That. 
So you can go through all these. You can go through the acoustic guitar ones. Old versions of Garage Man had many more of these. I don't know why they don't have so many now, um, which is a bit annoying, but that can really help. Now, if I turn on automation for the track too, because uh, something might have stuck out a little bit. I could have done this on the multi-track recorder before. Um, I press A on my keyboard and it suddenly shows me automation and I have a whole lot of different automations that I things that I can change if I want to look at that a whole lot of stuff I only ever do um, pan and volume and it's pretty much only volume that I, I would change during a track um, so if I want to do that I'm just going to stretch that out a little bit and uh, I mean I, I wouldn't even normally do this but I occasionally would is um, you know do a little crescendo like that interesting it changed the um changed the dynamic too but you can do that and then press a, a again and it goes away and that will be saved so you know if you happen to have played a phrase in in your section that's a little bit loud uh you can just bring it down all the same if it's too soft because uh, that will often happen or you'll find you know you're in the bottom register on the flute and if your bottom register is like mine it's not very strong but you need it to be a bit louder then you can just boost it uh with the dynamic there all right well there's a few I'll come back to here. There's a few uh, tips and trick, tricks for you. I'm, I'm sure I could do just as long as a video, a video and give you a whole lot of different ones. Think about your questions and good luck with your task.